please. Thank you. Um, questions of that notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On the 15th of July, the Morrison Joyce government declared that it would not join a United States evacuation mission to rescue Afghan civilians who helped Australia and that it had no plan to mount a similar operation. Why? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Wong for her question. And can I at the outset acknowledge that the situation in Afghanistan is one that is evolving quite rapidly. It remains highly volatile and is a dangerous situation. Our highest priority as a government is indeed to secure the safe and orderly departure of those Australian citizens still in Afghanistan, their families, uh, Afghan former locally engaged employees, other visa holders, permanent residents, and indeed the assistance that we are providing uh, as a government to uh, the United States, to New Zealand, uh, to the UK, uh, to Fiji and other nations in relation to helping uh, with their foreign nationals, as we acknowledge and thank many other nations uh, assisting us. Uh, since the 18th of August, Australia uh, has supported uh, the evacuation uh, of around 1,000 people from Afghanistan. Uh, over some 12 flights uh, through our work uh, with the UK and with other nations. We do urge the Taliban to ensure the ability for the safe and orderly departure uh, of people seeking to leave the country. We join international calls for the Taliban to cease all violence against civilians, to adhere to international humanitarian law and to respect all Afghans' human rights, especially those of women and girls. Our work in relation to helping people to depart Afghanistan has been ongoing for some time. Since the 15th of April 2021, uh, the Australian government has brought out more than 430 Afghan locally engaged staff and their families to be resettled in Australia under our humanitarian visa policy, an arrangement that's been in place since 2013 and has supported more than 1,900 people to do so during that time, Mr. President. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. On the 1st of June, the United King Kingdom announced an acceleration of its relocation policy, offering priority relocation to the UK for Afghans at risk that were or had worked with them. On the 18th of June, Germany expanded its eligibility criteria. However, the Morrison Joyce government did neither. Why? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I don't accept the, uh, the insinuation there around a lack of action in relation to uh, the actions and support our government's provided. Uh, Australia, unlike many other countries, has had in place uh, special visa arrangements for some time to support those who have worked alongside uh, our forces and others who have been serving in Afghanistan. That's what's enabled us to see some 1,900 visas specifically provided to Afghan locally engaged staff and their families at risk of harm all the way back to 2013. Recognising what was happening in Afghanistan, uh, we worked hard to make sure that we uh, expedited processing around uh, such applications during the course of this year. Uh, and that's what enabled more than 430 uh, Afghan locally engaged staff uh, to be able to access those visas and be resettled in Australia in the period since 15 April. Clearly, the deteriorating security situation has meant more Order, urgent steps Senator necessary, Birmingham. and that's what Senator we're taking. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Nasir, an interpreter for the ADF, has been resettled in Australia and has family in Afghanistan who fear reprisals. Australian authorities told them to send visa applications by post. Impossible in the chaos of Kabul. They turned to US soldiers who were willing to put them on an evacuation flight, even with limited documents. Why was it left to the US to help those caught up by Australia's bureaucratic gridlock? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Senator Wong, uh, without some uh, forewarning, it's impossible for me to be able to uh, specifically address the individual case you mentioned. 
Uh, but I can assure you, uh, the Senate and all Australians, uh, that the Australian officials working on the ground in Afghanistan, officials from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, from the Department of Home Affairs, uh, and of course our Defence Force personnel there, uh, are working uh, quickly uh, to ensure rapid processing uh, of visas that enable the evacuation of people uh, who may be in circumstances where they are immediate family, for example, of Australian citizens, immediate family, uh, permanent residents, or immediate family of uh, those locally engaged staff who have supported Australia. Uh, that work is being supported uh, by Home Affairs and other officials uh, here in Australia, uh, as well as around the world, in terms of enabling uh, us to provide quick, rapid responses. And now in relation Order, to the individual Senator circumstance... Birmingham, time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the situation in Afghanistan? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Smith for his question. Uh, Mr President, the situation in Afghanistan remains dangerous and volatile a week after the Taliban entered the capital of Kabul. We have all been devastated uh, by the return of the Taliban, but we are focused squarely on the challenges ahead of us, ensuring the safe evacuation of Australians, uh, holders of Australian visas, and in working with the international community to continue supporting the people of Afghanistan. The instability certainly makes our work all the more difficult. Uh, nevertheless, we are working closely and very well with our US, UK, German and other partners at the Hamad Karzai International Airport uh, in one of the most challenging people movements we have undertaken for decades. We're absolutely focused on bringing out every Australian and Australian visa holder that we possibly can. Cooperation does continue to be the key and we'll continue working closely with our partners for as long as we are able to to get people out. There is discussion, as we have seen, about the prospect of the US extending its withdrawal deadline. We are part of those discussions and we are absolutely ready to, continue a, uh, to support a continuing operation at Hamad Karzai International Airport. Mr President, the international community is watching the Taliban for its acts of injustice. It must observe all of its obligations to uphold international law and human rights. We call on the Taliban and continue to call on the Taliban to cease all violence against civilians and to adhere to international humanitarian law and the human rights to which all Afghans are entitled, in particular women and girls. This is an immensely difficult situation. It is terrifying and distressing for every person, every family, trying to get to the airport and for everyone worried about family members, friends, colleagues and contacts, and a huge Order. task being Senator undertaken Payne. by Australian Senator personnel. Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise the Senate on the progress of our airlift to evacuate Australians, holders of Australian visas and their families from Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator Smith. Uh, since the 18th of August, we have evacuated over 1,000 people on 12 flights, including Australian and New Zealand nationals, Australian visa holders and foreign nationals. In the last 24 hours, we have evacuated over 450 people from Kabul on four ADF flights. We have a significant presence on the ground at Hamad Karzai International Airport, including Defense, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade officers, Australian Defence Force personnel, Department of Home Affairs officials and Australian Border Force members. And I thank every single one of those women and men for the extraordinary job they are doing. We've evacuated not just our own people, but people on behalf of the United Kingdom, the United Sp States, New Zealand, as well as Fiji. Many of you know that talking to my office, the Minister for Defence's office, the Ministers for Home Affairs and Immigration's offices and our consular team, what a task is being undertaken. I thank all colleagues, members and senators uh, for their engagement on behalf Order. of so many Senator Australians Payne. and Afghanis. Senator Smith, for... a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister update the Senate on Australia's continuing support for the people of Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The Morrison government will maintain our support for the people of Afghanistan through this crisis and beyond in the coming years, working closely with other donors to identify and respond to the most pressing needs. 
Our $50 million bilateral program uh, will focus on the immediate crisis and increasingly on humanitarian outcomes, including in response to the current drought, to internal displacement, to COVID-19 and to economic stability, all factors exacerbating the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan right now. We're working closely with our long-standing partners, including the World Food Programme, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and the United Nations Population Fund. We have committed $5 million to the UNHCR supplementary appeal to assist internally displaced Afghans and support those neighbouring countries hosting Afghan refugees. We'll continue to work with the international community to hold the Taliban to account and to support the people of Afghanistan. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. I refer to reports that the New South Wales Minister for Health, Brad Hazard, wrote to Minister Hunt on August 11 requesting the Australian Defence Force open vaccination centres in Sydney and in the state's west. Now 12 of New South Wales' hardest hit local government areas in western Sydney are facing even tighter restrictions, including curfews, and the state is facing an ever worsening outbreak. Why, almost two weeks later, has the Morrison-Joyce government failed to formally respond to the New South Wales government's request for help in Western Sydney? Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, uh, and I thank Senator Kinley for her question. Uh, I don't have a full brief on this matter, but let me provide the information that I do have to uh, the Senate. Uh, as I understand it, um, Mr. President, uh, the New South Wales Minister for Health wrote to the Commonwealth Minister for Health, uh, Minister Hunt, on the 11th of August and was responded to by phone on the same day, followed up by phone on the 12th of August with a formal reply set by letter on the 13th of August. Uh, this fact has been acknowledged and confirmed by Mr Hazard on several occasions. Uh, on the 12th of August, at a press conference, Minister Hazard, uh, I am advised, said they responded very quickly, and I think, think, think Minister Hunt responded within minutes to say they would see what they could do, try to get onto it. So we've just got to hope everyone's got enough staff, enough vaccine to be able to get up there and do what we need to do. The 13th of August, again, Mr Hazard said they've stepped up. Minister Hunt responded quite quickly. I think it was within an hour or two he responded to me and indicate they would have the appropriate committees put in place to get the ADF working with the public health network up there with the Western New South Wales local health district. The Commonwealth responded within 24 hours by commissioning 50 ADF for community support and compliance and also five ADF medical teams of up to 14 members each for Western New South Wales. Uh, in addition, or, or order, sorry, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I do appreciate the uh, minister's um, information. Uh, however, and at this point of order on relevance, the question specifically was about Western Sydney, not Western New South Wales. Um, They're two Senator different places. Keneally, with respect, I think the minister. There was a preamble to the question. That was the point of the interview question. The minister outlined at the beginning that they were providing the information they had available. I, I'm, I would be reluctant to rule what the minister is saying as not in order, given the question. Um, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, as I understand it, there are already 300 ADF on the ground in Western Sydney as part of a joint operation with New South Wales Police. Uh, as at the 22nd of August, across the 12 affected local government areas of concern in Greater Sydney, 777 primary care and Commonwealth sites are administering the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, including 500 general practices, 266 of which are also offering the Pfizer vaccine, seven general practice respiratory clinics, uh, four Aboriginal community controlled health services and 176 community pharmacies. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Will the Morrison-Joyce government agree to the New South Wales government's request for ADF support to boost vaccination, not the police checks on homes, but vaccination in Western Sydney? Yes or no? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I indicated, um, there are a number of, of defence uh, teams and personnel in New South Wales supporting uh, New South Wales requirements. Defence has also deployed five vaccine delivery teams to support New South Wales Health in regional New South Wales. Uh, Defence is supporting New South Wales Health by providing 12 public health support teams to assist with COVID-19 case management. Uh, there are also five vaccine delivery teams to support New South Wales Health in regional New South Wales. There are eight teams. 
operating at the New South Wales Public Health Emergency Operations Centre in St Leonard's. Two teams are operating in facilities in Parramatta. One team is operating in Liverpool. One team is operating at Nepean Hospital. Defence has committed to four further teams to assist New South Wales Health with these activities from tomorrow, the 24th of August. These personnel will be deployed to New South Wales Health Districts as required. Defence has responded to all requests Order. for assistance Senator from Emergency Payne. Management Senator Australia. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Why is the Morrison-Joyce government quick to use the ADF in political ads in the midst of the black summer bushfire season? but not quick to assist the people of southwest and western Sydney to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Senator Payne. There are two things about that, Mr President. The first is that at a point in time in which the Australian Defence Force is not only on the ground in Sydney and New South Wales and other parts of Australia responding to COVID-19 critical needs, the ADF Men and women are also on the ground, Mr President, in Kabul, in Afghanistan, in Al Minhad, supporting the most extraordinary emergency evacuation we have undertaken order. in decades. Senator, and all I'll, I'll take that the point of order, Senator, Senator Payne. Senator Keneally. The question was not about Kabul. The question was not about Afghanistan. It was about the Morrison-Joyce government use of the ADF in political Senator advertising Keneally. and in COVID Senator, vaccines. I'm going, I'm going to remind yeah. senators that. When they stand to raise a point of order, don't just go straight to restating the question. At least try and have a semblance of the standing orders by mentioning the standing order. Senator Keneally, I've ruled before that when questions are politically loaded, a minister can respond in kind. Your earlier questions were specific, and I think a lot of specific information was provided. There's an opportunity to debate them under question, after question time, but that had loaded language and the minister is in order responding. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. As I said in my previous response, as at the 22nd of August, across the 12 affected local government areas of concern in Greater Sydney, 777 primary care and Commonwealth sites are administering the AstraZeneca vaccine, including those 590 general practices, seven general practice respiratory clinics, four Aboriginal community controlled health services, and 176 Order. community Senator pharmacies. Senator Payne, time for the answer has expired. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the uh, Liberal and Nationals government's economic plan and the national plan to transition Australia's national COVID-19 response agreed by our national cabinet what? will help to chart our economic recovery from the pandemic? I've asked before for silence during questions, particularly as we have so many people participating remotely. The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. And Mr President, the Morrison government is committed to putting in place those policies that will help employers out there create jobs across our nation. In terms of the beginning of COVID-19, as my colleagues know, we entered COVID-19 with a strong labour market. In fact, around 1.6 million jobs had been created since we were first elected to govern. We also had the lowest welfare dependency in 30 years. Mr President, by providing employers and businesses the economic framework to lever off, they were able to prosper, to grow and do what we needed them to do. And that was, of course, create more job opportunities for Australians. We also know, though, that COVID-19 has changed so much of this. We are still dealing with it, and we are still dealing with the lockdowns that are affecting millions of Australians, both in their jobs and their employers across our country. We also know that the road ahead will be a long road, it will be a hard road, and it will be a bumpy road. However, what we have seen is that the Australian Labor Force has demonstrated and continues to demonstrate remarkable resilience. In particular, when we look at the latest figures which show this, unemployment in Australia fell from 4.9 per cent to 4.6 per cent recently, with the creation of 2,200 jobs. And as a government, we've worked with the states and territories, and together we've charted a plan out of this pandemic and as a government, we continue to provide the support, in particular the economic supports, 
that will help both businesses and Australians get to the other side. In terms of our economy, we continue to be in a stronger position to recover than what we were a year ago. And we will continue to work with states and territories to Cash. plan our path. Senator path Bragg, out. a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. How is the government supporting businesses and protecting jobs through the current lockdowns and restrictions that are in place to help suppress COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the government has provided unprecedented support as we should to both Australians and Australian businesses since the commencement of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've provided now over $300 billion in direct health and economic support. Much of that support, as we know, was aimed at keeping Australian businesses operating and keeping Australians in jobs. But as the outbreaks that we are currently seeing in Australia, Australia and Australians, we are not out of the woods yet. The Morrison government continues to work with the states and territories to assist their businesses and to support their staff who are impacted by COVID-19. We've expanded Queensland's COVID-19 business support grants to $600 million. We've provided $12.5 million for NT businesses. We've increased support for Victorian businesses to over $800 million. Again, we will continue to provide the support Order, that Australians Senator need. Cash. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How can each and every Australian do their bit to help us get out of this pandemic and to get Australian business back into business and Australians back to work? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we know, the best way for each and every one of us to help small businesses in particular, to ensure our businesses can stay open and to ensure that Australians can get back to work is to get vaccinated. As more and more Australians get vaccinated, what we'll do is we'll rob the virus of its potency and the power to disrupt our lives. And it's really pleasing to see more and more Australians every single day putting their arms out and getting vaccinated. When we look at those vaccination rates, we went from 15 million doses to 16 million Order. doses in five days, and we went from 16 million doses to 17 million doses in an even smaller period of time. That is what each and every one of us needs to do. And certainly on those figures, there are positive signs that Australians are taking up the opportunity and they do see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mr Order, President, Senator each Watt. and every one of us has a role to play and encouraging Australians to get vaccinated is what Order. we need to do. Senator Watt, count to 10 after your call to order. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Mr President. Um, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. But before I ask my question, I just want to acknowledge that the situation outside Kabul, of course, is extremely difficult and fluid. And I'd like to thank uh, Ministers Payne and Hawke for working with Green senators over the last week to try and get people evacuated. Given the humanitarian crisis facing the people of Afghanistan, the Canadian and the UK governments have announced that they would take an extra 20,000 refugees, whilst Australia is only committed to 3,000 within the existing CAPT program. The Prime Minister says 3,000 is just a floor, not a ceiling. Well, why won't Mr Morrison then do what Mr Abbott did in 2015, match what other countries are doing and give more places to refugees fleeing Afghanistan, making sure that Australia stands by those who stand by us? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson Young uh, for her question, and, uh, and can I thank her for the acknowledgement of those ministers who have been engaging with uh, Green senators in relation to assisting with the extraction of individuals from Afghanistan. Uh, indeed, can I thank many members of the Senate and uh, and across the Parliament for engagement with local constituencies on those matters, uh, and uh, and particularly uh, whilst I know ministers are working hard on it. Uh, again, thank those many officials working around the clock to do so, especially those officials from various agencies who uh, have been redeployed uh, either to uh, the United Arab Emirates or indeed into Afghanistan to help in these uh, dangerous and challenging circumstances. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, uh, through you, Mr. President, uh, indeed the government does recognise the humanitarian uh, challenges that exist in relation to what is occurring in Afghanistan. Uh, it is why we've made uh, the swift announcement in relation uh, to there being 3,000 places 
this financial year in this current financial year's humanitarian intake uh, to be dedicated uh, to ensuring that Afghani citizens uh, are offered permanent protection in Australia. Since the 1st of July 2013, more than 8,500 visas have been granted uh, to Afghani citizens under Australia's humanitarian visa program. Uh, we remain committed to, uh, to working carefully to give um, priority uh, to persecuted minorities, to women and children, uh, and to those who have links to Australia, such as family members. Uh, we'll work, as always, through the processes to ensure that applicants uh, satisfy public interest criteria for character, security and health, uh, making sure that we do keep the safety and security of Australians as being of paramount importance. And importantly, we'll work with Afghan community leaders in Australia through this process. We'll also work with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, to help to identify those most in need. Order. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you. 4,400 Afghans reside in Australia on temporary visas. Why won't the Prime Minister give them permanent protection? They're here already. Many have been here for many, many years. They can't go back. Why not end their limbo now, allowing them to rebuild their lives without the fear of the Taliban? Where is the Prime Minister's compassion for those who are already here so that they can call Australia home? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, this is indeed a sensitive issue and topic. It is sensitive because we wish to make clear that, obviously, in all of the current circumstances and for the foreseeable future, given the security situation in Afghanistan, uh, nobody is going to be repatriated or expected to return to Afghanistan, given the threats that may exist. However, it's also important in terms of the protection of life uh, and the protection uh, of our migration system in a way that enables us to make decisions to prioritise uh, those most in need, most appropriate uh, to be able to come to Australia, uh, that we maintain confidence and order in that migration program. That requires us to make sure that the policy settings we've put in place that have stopped the tragic flow of boats to Australia, a tragic flow of boats that saw so many people lose their lives, that saw people smugglers gain an upper hand and take advantage of vulnerable people, doesn't have any opportunity to restart. And that's why we're keeping in place policies that Order. stopped that. Senator Birmingham, Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Well, the double standard of this government never ceases to amaze. On the same day as trumpeting a new agricultural visa which provides a permanent pathway for agricultural workers, the Prime Minister is refusing to allow people who are already here on Australian soil to stay here permanently, to rebuild their lives. How is this fair? How is this fair to leave these people living in limbo while opening up the door to others? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, what's not fair is to have a circumstance where people smugglers across different parts of Asia take advantage of some of the most vulnerable people. Take advantage by taking their money, take advantage by putting them on rickety boats, dangerous boats, take advantage of putting them in situations of harm's way where they may well find themselves losing their life on a perilous journey to Australia, as many others did before. What wouldn't be fair is if community confidence in our humanitarian program, our migration program, was undermined to the extent we were unable to continue to be one of the most generous countries in the world on a per capita basis when it comes to the resettlement of refugees. What wouldn't be fair is if it was undermined to the extent where we were unable to make the types of decisions we have to put a dedicated number of places in place to support Afghani citizens. That's why it's important that we maintain confidence and settings in those programs so that we can give priority where appropriate by maintaining that community confidence in an orderly Order, system. Senator Birmingham, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today, New South Wales recorded 818 new COVID 19 cases. There are now 100 people in the ICU and tragically 74 deaths from the current outbreak. This is the third consecutive day of more than 800 cases in New South Wales, with the highest ever number of daily cases, 830, recorded yesterday. Can the minister confirm that Australia is now experiencing the highest number of daily cases since the beginning of the pandemic, more than 18 months ago? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thanks, Senator McAllister, for the question, Mr. President. And it is true that over the last few days, the number of cases per day in New South Wales has been the highest since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Mr. President. And we are seeing, and we are seeing, um, the very, very difficult effects, the very, very difficult effects Order. of, of Order. the Delta variant of the virus, which clearly transmits much more quickly uh, in the community, and we've seen uh, a number of states now struggle with that. We're seeing exactly the same concerns being expressed in Victoria, where there were 70 odd cases today. Uh, and Mr. President, so, so clearly, clearly the Delta variant, uh, which the government has been quite open and upfront with the Australian people about, is a completely new ball game with respect to the management of COVID-19. Uh, we're seeing here in the ACT how quickly the numbers increased uh, once the the, uh, vaccine, the, the variant uh, arrived in the ACT, Mr. President. Uh, and we're seeing the concerns expressed by state leaders all around the country, Mr. President. And the New South Wales government, working with the Australian government, is doing everything that it can to suppress the spread of the virus. Uh, that is our responsibility. That is what we're trying to do, Mr. President. Uh, and, and alongside that growth in numbers, we are seeing every single day an increase in the number of Australians who are vaccinated. Uh, we've, we've passed 17 million, people vac uh, 17 million vaccinations administered in this country, Mr. President, and that, and that rollout continues Order. to develop in speed as we said it would, Mr. President. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. Based on current projections, when and at what level will daily cases peak? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Order. Mr. President. Mr. President, as I indicated in my uh, answer to the primary question, the New South Wales government, along with the Commonwealth, is doing everything that they possibly can to suppress the transmission of the virus. Can I say to people in New South Wales, particularly in those LGAs, Oh, sorry, of Senator McAllister on a point of order. Point of order is relevant. It was a very specific question about the projections about daily case numbers. Um, the minister has been speaking for 19 seconds. I've allowed you to remind the minister of it. I will listen carefully while he has 41 seconds remaining. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say to all people in New South Wales, particularly those in the LGAs where the virus is spreading? Uh, more rapidly. Please obey the instructions and the conditions imposed of the New South Wales government. Please do that, because the virus moves with people and Order. it transmits Senator, with people. Senator and Colbeck, it's only please when your seat, Senator Colbeck. Senator McAllister on a point of order. My point of order is relevant. The minister has 18 seconds left. He was asked a very specific question about the projections, about the level of daily cases and when they would peak. If he doesn't know the answer, he should take it on notice. Um, I can't instruct the minister how. I, I, I do take the point that the minister has been speaking for over 40 seconds. Um, it was a question specific in nature, and so I take the time to remind the minister of the question because the time for what a more general commentary has passed. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President, because it's only when people stop moving and interacting with each other, that we will see a reduction in the transmission of the virus. Mr President, it's all very well to come in here to ask impossible to answer questions, but the, the virus travels with people and it is people's— Order. And it is the Order. Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. 18 months into the pandemic, Australia is experiencing the highest daily case numbers, and millions of Australians are in lockdown in New South Wales, in Victoria and in the ACT. Does Mr Morrison regret failing to secure enough vaccines and repeatedly telling Australians that the vaccine rollout is not a race? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I re completely reject the assertion I completely reject the assertion that the Australian government has not secured enough vaccines. 
We have, we have, Order. We have procured over 100 million doses of vaccine. Order. Senator Watt. Over 100 million doses of vaccine. We have available and, and will be available Senator McAllister. enough vaccines uh, that will be developed for the possibility of booster shots down the track, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, Order. we will Senator continue Hughes, to do Watt. what we said we would do, which is to continue to increase the Senators supply, Hughes and continue Watt. to increase the opportunity for Australians to take up the vaccine. Mr. President. There are over 8,000 points in this country right now where people can get access to a vaccine. Mr. President. And that's not true, Senator. I will take your interjection. The Victorian Premier even said today that there are open opportunities Order. for vaccines Order. Senator Colbeck, in Victoria time for the today. answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Well, Senator O'Neill, I call I am going to insist that when senators are not called by name, they pay some heed to that. We have half the Senate participating remotely. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Minister, the Prime Minister has provided his very clear support for organisations to introduce requirements for mandatory vaccination for their staff. What message does the government have for workers who object to mandatory vaccination? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Hanson for her question. Um, can, I, uh, can I at the outset emphasise the government has said all along uh, that vaccination is a voluntary program, that we as a government are not mandating it, aside from in certain very high-risk health areas where it is still not Commonwealth legislation doing so, but where we've worked with states and territories in terms of mandating vaccination, such as in relation to health or aged care workers, for example. It is correct that Australia's workplace relations laws do allow for businesses to put in place um, arrangements that are reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of people that they work alongside of, uh, or indeed customers that they may work with. It is for businesses to make an assessment in relation to that reasonableness test, and some have chosen to do so in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine, as is their rights under, uh, under existing workplace arrangements. We do encourage all Australians to get vaccinated. And in doing so, I want to thank and acknowledge the millions of Australians who've done so to date, driving total vaccinations administered in Australia to in excess of 17.1 million doses to date. And that has ensured that we have now a nearly 53% of all eligible Australians over the age of 16 having had a first dose. Indeed, of the first age cohort to be eligible for the vaccine, the over 70s, we've now seen more than 85% of those over 70s have a first dose and more than 57% of them being fully vaccinated. Of those over 50s, more than 75% of them Order. have had a first dose. And these are very encouraging numbers and I continue to urge Australians to make a booking, to get out there, to do the thing that can best Senator save Andrew. them, their loved ones and their families and their workmates, and that is to get vaccinated. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, should there be a limit on this policy? I reference SPC, which is a cannery in regional Victoria, where the staff do not come in contact with the public in the normal course of their duties. Why would they need to be vaccinated? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, it is a matter for SPC to speak for themselves, although I gather they have highlighted that uh, within a food manufacturing uh, workplace such as theirs, with a production line such as theirs, uh, their staff work in close proximity uh, to one another, uh, and that indeed there are issues that they've worked through and consulted with their workforce on. It is a matter for them in terms of the engagement, the consultation with their workforce, and a matter for them in terms of the advice they seek and the analysis they undertake as to whether they meet the reasonableness test uh, that applies in relation to being able to put such a requirement in place. Uh, that's something that Australian businesses had as available to them prior to COVID-19 uh, in terms of such reasonable health decisions being a part of workplace uh, arrangements. 
and it's something that continues. Obviously, there need to be provisions to enable those who have genuine medical or other reasons not to be vaccinated, and I understand such businesses who are making these decisions are applying those arrangements to. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Um, in light of your response to that, uh, Minister, and given the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Ministers that your strong support for organisations mandating compulsory vaccination in a wide variety of circumstances, will the Prime Minister require Liberal and National Party candidates in the next election to be vaccinated? And will the Prime Minister require disendorsement of members and senators who are not vaccinated? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, as I said at the outset, uh, vaccination is a voluntary program. As I've emphasised in both previous answers, uh, there are provisions within Australia's laws that existed prior to the pandemic that enable businesses to put in place reasonable practices uh, to ensure the health and safety of co-workers, customers and others that people engage with. Now, I make it very clear. I urge every single member of the coalition and every single member of the parliament to get vaccinated, just as I do every single Australian. I've done so, my wife's done so, my parents, my family, others have done so, uh, and I encourage all to do so, and I would expect any member of the government to do so and to encourage their constituents to do so in a way that helps to continue to build those numbers, which we've seen grow so remarkably in recent times that we are now vaccinating in the space of a week a city the entire size of Adelaide. Order, Indeed, Senator Birmingham, even faster. time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture in Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. Minister, following today's announcement about the Australian agricultural visa, can you please inform how our government is supporting our agricultural industry and regional communities through the establishment of this visa. The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Davey, for your question. As the regional specialist, the Nationals are extremely proud to be part of a government that unashamedly backs our primary industry. Order. We know that agriculture needs workers, it needs workers now and well into the future. And today, Order. our government has announced further details outlining the establishment of the Australian Agriculture Visa. It's a big win for farmers. It's a big win for rural communities who rely on agriculture and a big win for the state of New South Wales, Senator Davey, and the rice industry. This is one of the biggest structural reforms in the history of our agricultural sector. Farmers have been calling for it, and we as a government have delivered on it. The important new visa will support Australian farmers now and into the future by providing a wider pool of workers to help meet increasing seasonal workforce demands. The visa will be available to skilled, semi-skilled and unskilled workers right across the agriculture sector, including meat processing, the fishing industry, forestry industry, dairy industry, horticulture. The initial regulatory framework implementing this visa will be in place by the end of September, with full implementation of the demand-driven visa category within three years. The ag visa, over time, will respond to systematic workforce shortages uh, and was a result of the changes to the Working Holiday Maker program developed as part of the UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement. It will also include a pathway to permanent residency, potentially giving the workers who have helped get the crops off to actually settle permanently in regional Australia with us. Importantly, workers under the visas will be covered by the same workplace laws, entitlements and protections of Australian citizens. Order. Absolutely. Regional Order Australia will lead our nation's recovery from COVID-19, and this visa will help us have the skilled workforce Order, we Senator need. Senator McKenzie. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And, uh, Minister, this is not the only uh, uh, example of what we're doing to support our agricultural industries address the current workforce shortages. Can you outline the range of programs we've implemented to do this? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. The new agriculture visa builds on a number of other measures our government has delivered. 
In September last year, we restarted Pacific labour mobility programs, and since the restart, over 10,000 workers have arrived from the Pacific and Timor-Leste. These Pacific workers have been invaluable to our agricultural sector and will continue to be the mainstay of our overseas agricultural workforce well into the future. We will also be doubling the number of Pacific workers in Australia, with an extra 12,500 uh, people to be recruited by March 2022. We have committed $29.8 million to fund initiatives to improve employment opportunities in the ag sector, including attracting domestic workforce, uh, actually ensuring we have got incentives to help people, particularly young people, move to the regions, and it is great to see over 3,000 have done that. We have also designed and delivered the Agricultural Workers' Code so that workers could cross state borders and get the crops off in time during COVID. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And Minister, can you please explain what the barriers are that, face, that our farmers and regional communities face in addressing their workforce shortages? Senator McKenzie. Well, yes, I can, Senator Davey. The biggest barrier by, for farmers and regional communities is the Australian Labor Party. They have not Order. met a farm and a farmer and a primary industry that they don't want to shut down tomorrow, whether it is our fantastic fishing industry in partnership with Wish Wilson and the Greens, if it is our magnificent, sustainable hardwood forestry industry, lock it up and leave it. We don't want any jobs out in rural and regional Australia. That's the Australian Labor Party. And I tell you what, talk to the live uh, cattle or sheep trade. Shut it down. Shut it down is the Australian Labor Party. You just want to wrap up our primary industries in red and green tape. You have no understanding of the contribution they make to our local economies, but also our national economy. And really, it's, I think, Mr President, one thing that we do need to raise in the context of the ag visa is the importance of quarantine systems from our state and territory governments. Order. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On the 24th of June, as Delta continued to spread through the Bondi cluster, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, I commend Premier Berichiklian for resisting going into a full lockdown. Does he stand by this statement? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, I think I answered almost an identical question sometime in the previous sitting fortnight, whether it was from Senator Sheldon or another senator, uh, I'm not sure. But, Mr President, uh, as the Prime Minister himself has made clear and as I told the Chamber at that time, our knowledge understanding of the Delta variant and how it is that we need to respond to it uh, has only grown, as indeed our knowledge right throughout the COVID-19 pandemic has grown, uh, given the evolving nature of it. Now, this is a once-in-a-century pandemic. The scientific analysis, the evidence, the advice continues to evolve, and we've responded to it and adapted to it as we've gone along. We recognise the fact that uh, for so much of the pandemic, New South Wales, with one of the best contact tracing systems in the world, was able to effectively respond to small outbreaks and clusters, to be able to effectively drive the testing, undertake the contact tracing and enforce the isolating that kept the people of New South Wales safe during those outbreaks. Tragically, in relation, to this, tragically, in relation to this latest outbreak, and we do have the circumstance uh, where, of course, it's been necessary for New South Wales to pursue lockdowns, and regrettably, those lockdowns order. have Senator not been Birmingham, able to. Senator I've got to Senator act. Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Thanks, Mr. President. On relevance, it was a pretty straight question asking whether Minister Birmingham stood uh, and the Prime Minister stood by his earlier statement. We're getting a long dissertation from Senator Birmingham, but we're not getting an Senator answer to that Watt. question. Um, the material Senator Birmingham is outlining is directly relevant. That point of order goes to attempting to instruct me how to, a minister, to inst instruct a minister how to answer the question, which I cannot do. The minister is being directly relevant with this material. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. As I said earlier in the answer, these are points the Prime Minister himself has made publicly in response to questions like those that Senator Sheldon has just asked. Uh, tragically, in New South Wales, we do have the circumstance now. Uh, where, of course, the lockdown has been necessary. Order. It's been necessary, very necessary for New South Wales to tighten aspects of that lockdown. And we have made sure the provision, as Senator Payne referenced earlier, 
Australian Defence Force personnel to seek to help New South Wales in the enforcement of that lockdown, as we've made such ADF resources available to other states and territories before, whether it be in lockdown enforcement, border enforcement, uh, or indeed testing or other regimes to support Lord, uh, Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. On the 15th of August, after the Bondi cluster had spread throughout the state, Mr Morrison claimed he told Premier Berichiklian to lock down the entire state. Why did Mr Morrison insist that South West and Western Sydney go into a hard lockdown when he previously insisted Bondi, where the Delta outbreak started, remain open? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we have sought through this uh, pandemic to work as best we can with state and territory governments who have uh, the public health powers and abilities to be able to put in place the restrictions that have so effectively kept uh, Australia safe. Despite the very challenging, very difficult circumstances we know that Australians in lockdown face at present, uh, the tragic circumstances for those who've lost loved ones to COVID-19, uh, be it in the current New South Wales outbreak, last year's Victorian outbreak, or other circumstances in Australia, as a nation, we have still performed far, far better uh, than almost any other developed country around the world in terms of suppressing COVID-19, in terms of saving lives, and in terms of ensuring that our country is as strongly placed, placed for the future as is possible. And we're going to continue to build on that uh, through the rapid escalation we've seen in the vaccine rollout, working with the states and territories, with health professionals, our general practitioners, pharmacies to keep that momentum in vaccination. Going. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Well, will uh, Minister Morrison have stepped responsibility and apologise to the people of South West and Western Sydney who are in a harsh lockdown as a result of his failure to secure enough vaccine supply and his failure to build purpose-built quarantine? Senator Van. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, like Senator Colbeck previously, uh, I reject completely the assertion in relation uh, to vaccine supply. Uh, Australia has contracted Order. some 180 million doses uh, of vaccine for primary supply and many tens of millions of doses now to support booster shots. Uh, of course, as is well known, there have been some challenges in the vaccine supply. And the challenges in terms of early failure to deliver uh, from Europe to Australia of some 3.4 million doses uh, that would have enabled us uh, to move faster earlier had those doses turned up. Challenges in relation to the changes in ATAGI advice related to AstraZeneca that are all too well known. Uh, but what we have managed to do is ensure Australia had fallback options with each of those challenges. Uh, with Order, the contract Senator we put in place with Pfizer, the contracts we put in place Senator with Moderna, the fact that we're now seeing Australians turn out in such record numbers uh, that indeed we are administering vaccines at a faster rate than many Order, other countries Senator have ever managed Birmingham, to achieve the is a testament to our public. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister Senator, outline to the Senate how Australia will take part in the Tokyo Paralympics? Order. Sorry, Senator Hughes. Please, I'm going to ask, I have repeatedly asked for silence during questions. Senator Hughes can start the question again. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please outline to the Senate how Australia will take part in the Tokyo Paralympics? The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can I thank the Senator for her question and acknowledge her interest? Mr President, the Tokyo Paralympics begins tomorrow with the holding of the opening ceremony and runs through to the 5th of September. I don't know about other senators, Mr President, but I am certainly looking forward to watching these Paralympic Games just as many Australians watched and enjoyed the Olympics that occurred just recently. And the pride of Australia from a Paralympic perspective will be on show for the world to see. These Paralympics, Mr President, offer another important opportunity for Australians to unite, celebrate the individual efforts of athletes who have overcome some extraordinary odds, Mr President. Uh, Paralympians in particular have done that. Athletes will be representing 163 nations and compete across 22 sports. Just like their Olympic counterparts, this Paralympic team is a source of inspiration 
to absolutely every one of us. Australia's team in Tokyo will be the largest ever at an overseas Paralympics and the biggest since Sydney in 2000 with 179 athletes. They will compete in 18 sports, including the debut disciplines of para taekwondo and para badminton. The team includes to be soon to be seven time Paralympians, Danny de Toro and Christy Dawes, as well as 84 athletes making their Olympic Games debut. The success of our athletes, Mr President, depends very much on the team behind the team, and the Australian Institute of Sport must be commended for its leadership assisting sports athletes, uh, particularly in managing the challenges of the pandemic. Can I say to Paralympics Australia, the President Jocko Callaghan, the Chief Executive Officer Lynn Anderson and the Chef de Mission Kate Order, McLaughlin, Senator Colbeck, thank you for your work the answer in assisting has expired. the Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting Australia's Paralympic team to get to and perform to their best in Tokyo? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Australian government is proud to support our athletes in achieving their Paralympic dreams. In fact, more than 85 per cent of athletes competing in Tokyo have received direct grants through the Australian Institute of Sport. This is in addition to other support for Paralympics Australia and para-athletes, para including $3.5 million in this year's budget to support Paralympics Australia to fund additional COVID-19 related costs such as charter flights and return quarantine arrangements for athletes and their supportive staff participating in the 2021 uh, Tokyo Paralympic Games. $4.5 million in 2021 and 2021-22 in increased funding direct to 13 Paralympic high performance sports in national sporting organisations to enhance preparations for Tokyo and beyond. $8 million over three years from 1819 to support the Australian Paralympic Order, team Colbeck. to prepare for these Senator games. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why is the Paralympics important to the broader population of the Australian community? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The Paralympics and our para athletes, as I've said, are an inspiration to us all, as well as elite athletes in their respective sports. These athletes have some extraordinary tales of hardship that they've overcome to comp be competing in these games. They are an enormous demonstration of how sport and physical activity can play an important role in our lives and, in some circumstances, Mr. President, give an opportunity that would not exist otherwise. And that's very much the case with the story of some of our para-athletes. They have opportunities that they would not have otherwise had. Mr. President, can I say to all Australians, I hope you enjoy the 2020 Paralympics. Uh, I look forward to watching them and I look forward to cheering on our athletes uh, to do their best, as I know that they're aspiring to do Order. over the next Senator few weeks. Colbeck. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday on Insiders, Mr Morrison said that high COVID case numbers shouldn't delay Australia's reopening, and I quote, at some point you need to make that gear change, and that is done at 70 per cent. Is it the Morrison-Joyce government's position that New South Wales, which recorded its worst day on Sunday with 830 new cases, should open up when it hits a rate of 70 per cent vaccination? irrespective of case numbers. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And, and what the Prime Minister was doing, Mr President, was reinforcing the work that has been prepared for National Cabinet, which has been agreed to by National Cabinet uh, and supported by the modelling of the Doherty Institute, Mr President. Order. Mr President. Uh, and, and to reinforce that, Mr President, the National Cabinet has requested that additional work to update that Doherty modelling uh, be con commissioned to support the program. And as the, as the Chief, Chief Medical Officer said yesterday, the fundamentals of that modelling don't change. The fundamentals of that modelling don't change. And Mr. President, I think it's dishonest of Labor 
as it has been throughout the pandemic, to be frank, to suggest that this, be, that, that, that this question be considered in isolation from all of the other things that we're doing, Mr. President, uh, including the increase in vaccination. We've seen over recent days, Mr. President, we've seen over recent days uh, over a million Australians in the last four days receive a vac vaccination. We've seen day after week, order. day after week, day, Mr. What? President. On a point of order. Thanks, Mr. President. On relevance, we're getting lots of rhetoric from the minister, but we're not getting an answer to the question, which is simply whether it's the government's position that New South Wales should open up when it hits a rate of 70 per cent vaccination, White, irrespective I, going, of case numbers. Again, Senator White, I'm going to insist that rather than just take the opportunity to say the answer is not appreciated and then read out the question again, particularly when it's only part of the question being read. You contained a number of quotations that refers to a rather comprehensive area of public policy. The minister is directly relevant to that by addressing the issue of vaccination. I can't instruct him how to answer a question, but I don't think anyone would assert that that is not relevant to the modelling that you refer to. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and of course, the modelling includes a whole range of different measures that support reopening the Australian economy, which is what we all want. Which is what we all want. We want Australians to be able to move more freely, and there are a number of actions that are being taken by state governments and Commonwealth governments to facilitate that. There's restrictions on movements that are being taken to limit the spread of the virus. That's what we're doing. Order. We're increasing and in continuing to increase the pace of the rollout, Mr. President, with records being posted nearly every day for the number of Australians who are turning out to get a vaccine. And we thank every single one of them for doing so, Mr. President. We thank everyone to, for doing so, and we encourage more to continue to do that, Mr. President. We want to see our economy open. We want to see Australians being able to move around, and we'll continue Order. to do everything Senator we can Colbeck. to facilitate Senator that. What a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the architects of the Doherty Institute modelling, Professor James McCaw, said last Friday that if New South Wales case numbers weren't reduced, that we'd need, and I quote, stronger social measures and stronger versions of lockdowns rather than weaker. Who is right, Mr Morrison or Professor McCaw? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I indicated a moment ago, the, pr the Prime Minister was reinforcing the agreement that he has made with state and territory leaders Order. to continue to open the economy, to o start opening the economy at certain points of vaccination rate. And Mr. President, to reinforce that, Order. to reinforce that, Mr. President, the, the National Order Cabinet has asked the Doherty Institute to do some further work. On the modelling, Mr. Senator President. McAllister. But our target, our aim, Mr. President, is to work with the states and territories in a cooperative manner to reinforce the need to get vaccinated, to provide the opportunity for Australians to take up vaccination, and to reduce the tr community transmission of the virus so Order. that we can reopen both our communities and our economy, which we know is what all Australians want, Mr. Yeah, President. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we will continue to do. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. University of Melbourne epidemiologist Professor Tony Blakely warned this morning, and I quote, if you've got high numbers, your contact tracing will be overwhelmed and you won't have as much of an effect from your vaccination coverage to keep things under control. Who is right, Mr Morrison Order. or Professor Blakely? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, what the government will continue to do is to take the advice of the health professionals who have been Order. guiding us through the process. Mr. President, when we received, Mr. President, the Doherty modelling, we released it to the public so that they could see it. Mr. President, and what I would urge the Australian public to do is to have a look at the Doherty modelling, and we will continue to release the information that allow Australians to be able to make their choices about yep. whether they should be able to talk, call on their state governments to open up their economies, Mr President. And we will continue to work to fight against the virus instead of, as the Labor opposition are doing, are fighting against us, Mr President. There's no Cedric Dublers on that side, Mr President. No Order. Cedric Dublers over there. They're not barracking for the Australian people or trying to Order. assist us to win this race Order. against the virus, Mr President. 
They're more Order. like the bloke in the Across back of the pack trying to tell the athletes Order. over, Mr President. We'll continue to work in the interest of the Australian people. Order. Yeah. Order. Order. Sen Senator McAllister, Senator O'Neill. Order! When I call people's names, I ask them to have some respect for the chair. I appreciate there was some volume in the chamber at that point because of the nature of the interjections and contribution, but I did call people to order on numerous occasions. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I ask that further questions be placed on notice.